everybody knows that uh, when he's uh, in the media, when he's getting from the media, when he's watching news, eVTOL is a main subject when it comes to aviation these days. And I have the honor that I have here on the stage, a little bit back though, that you can see all my guests, that we have uh, uh, guests from different uh, sectors of this eVTOL electric mobility field which are all working on the future and all have slightly different point of views, which we'll discover. Um, so I just start from the right, which is Greg Boltz from Gamma. He was founding and leading the EPIC committee at Gamma. And we had a meeting here at Aero over the last years of the Gamma EPIC committee. And this is really growing very fast, but he'll tell you more about this uh, in a second. Then we have Jörg Müller from uh, Airbus. He's in the UAM unit of Airbus, leading the project there. And uh, he'll tell you about this very interesting project we had recently with the uh, everybody, at least in Germany, has seen the release of the city Airbus. Then we have uh, Mirko Horno from Bauhaus Luftfahrt, and he will give us uh, a point of view of he's a researcher and he uh, is doing research on aviation future trends. And sure, urban air mobility is one, so I'm really interested to hear what is their point of view. Antonio Jagger from uh, Bosch uh, in the from the Bosch General Aviation in United States will give us how Bosch the uh, electronic, electric, huge, gigan gigantic company from Germany who is a main supplier for the car industry is thinking of what's happening in the other way of taxis because in every taxi on the ground probably there is some Bosch technology so let's see if also in the air taxi there would be something from Bosch. Right next to Bosch we have Siemens, everybody knows this company as well from the electronic, from every household where you have any dishwasher, anything from Siemens, from the train engines, from, so from public transport, electric transport, which they are doing for a long time already. And now, since several years, they do electric mobility. For example, in the air, they do the drive for uh, the Airbus, for example, but they do several other uh, electric aircraft. But Frank will that tell us more. Then uh, one person, uh, the next, Mark Moore from Uber, who is responsible for a part of the hype at least, I would say, because since Uber released their Elevate program, uh, the media has really rushed to air taxi, urban air mobility. Um, so we'll hear the latest ideas which are coming from Mark, who worked, by the way, before as a researcher at NASA, and also already a long time on what future aviation project could look like. And last but not least, we have Tian Yu from China. You've seen him here several times because we have the E-Flight Expo here now for 10 years. It's the 10th anniversary and he's been there at the very first one because he was doing several electric aircraft over the time and he's now also working on eVTOL. So I'm curious to see what is next? So, uh, the, the next slide, or do we have this? Is you see the new Eflay Expo logo, which you probably have realized. We've changed the logo in discussion here with the leaders of the Aero Fair because we decided before it was just Eflay Expo. We just had Eflay, but now we realize the main topics we're talking about is autonomous and VTOL. These are the subjects which will be the key features for urban air mobility. So we thought we put it into the logo. Some people say it looks like the dishwasher, but uh, we tried to get all the words in. So the next slide, we have our speakers here. And um, so now we go to our first speaker and we have Uber Elevate. Mark, it's yours. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. So I thought I'd just show a few slides that uh, provide some context for, for what we're doing. 
Um, and just to start off with, so you have an understanding where I'm coming from, I very much have a vehicle uh, bias. For 32 years at NASA, all I did was work on vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and develop new technologies. And over the last uh, decade, in fact, I focused on uh, these different flight demonstrators that were all showcasing the new technology set of distributed electric propulsion. So you can see all the way back to 2009 with the crazy little Puffin uh, electric aircraft to the NASA X-57. Um, all of these were, were projects that I was leading. So, so it is a, a wonderful time of opportunity where we have new technologies to design aircraft completely differently. This distributed electric propulsion really is a, 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 a game changer of a technology where now we can distribute the uh, propulsion and the control across the vehicle to be able to achieve completely redundant systems for thrust and control. That's just not how what you could do with helicopters, where there would be many different single parts that if any one of those failed, then that helicopter would also uh, fail. So we really have this incredible opportunity to design aircraft fundamentally different and to be very, very low noise and very, very safe. And, and, and that is what's fundamentally enabling this new market is through this new technology set and these new type of vehicles. Uh, from Uber, we feel that there's a compelling need while we're providing extensive uh, ground transportation networks that are on demand. Uh, we feel there's still this problem that uh, people are moving into cities and the growth that these cities are experiencing is causing incredible congestion delay and that we need to have another choice in transportation that can rise above this gridlock. So very much we are not approaching this from just a cool technology perspective, but from a, a, a need of our users to be able to have different and new choices in transportation that can be scaled. So here you see an example mission. What we're talking about is just serving the urban core markets where there's very high trip density and there can be economic feasibility. You can see the, the distances these vehicles fly are very short, on average 20 miles. And um, that's what really allows these vehicles to be taking advantage of battery electric technologies where the batteries do not provide long range, but it's sufficient for our needs. So you can see, in fact, the way that these aircraft are being designed. You can see the battery state of charge on the vertical axis and the time of day, where in the mornings and afternoons, we need to be designing the battery systems so they can do this three-hour sprint and still be able to uh, stay productive with only five minutes of time on the ground to be able to have very high utilization for these vehicles and be extremely effective. In fact, for each one of these aircraft, they are as effective as 20 UberX on the ground. So very, very high utilization, high productivity, high speed from these vehicles. We're working with five different companies that are developing demonstrators right now. Uh, each one you can see is completely different looking. That's proof that we really are in this wonderful time of, of change where it's like a Wright Brother era and everyone's still trying to figure out how to use these technologies to the best uh, to achieve the mission objectives. Very much we believe in achieving a high level of safety. Because of that, we're talking about fleet, fleet operations that only conduct those operations from established and well-controlled vertiports. Through these vert vertiports, we're able to do specific routes and be able to achieve very, very high throughput um, with each city having on the order of 300 to 1,000 aircraft per city. So very much from the beginning, we've designed the system, the airspace, the infrastructure, to be able to be a scale transportation solution. And with that, uh, we've chosen our first two uh, early adopter cities of Dallas and Los Angeles. In June, we'll announce a third international city, which will uh, begin operations in 2023. Before that, we'll be working with our partners to uh, conduct experimental uh, testing as soon as 2020 that will prove out just how safe and quiet 
these vehicles are and that they can be very good neighbors and a responsible transportation solution for cities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks for this really nice view to the future and all this nice computer animation. I think we're all looking forward to seeing the real aircraft flying soon. And um, on my side here, our next speaker is Greg Bolt from Gamma, who has is working very closely with uh, Uber and with all the other manufacturers who try to get this computer visions into visions in the sky. It's yours, Greg. Thank you very much, Willie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with a, a great group of friends on the stage. So um, that's correct. At Gamma, we've been working in this space for uh, about the last five years, and obviously in um, the whole range of aviation for uh, decades since the 1970s. So um, what I wanted to bring to us today, uh, the queue is not jumping forward. Maybe we can go forward one. That's not working. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So when I discuss general aviation, uh, we're talking about these things here. So we're talking about traditionally business aircraft, pistons, uh, helicopters, or rotorcraft. And what we're not including traditionally is the commercial airlines and military. So if we look at today's environment around the world uh, and the scale of aviation, it's interesting because all of those things I mentioned are everything except for the blue slice. So that blue slice is what the population, the general population, not here at Aero today, but most of the world only understands that little blue slice. Um, that's a tiny fraction of vehicles in the sky. And we are sitting here today talking about uh, an era of aviation where something much, much bigger touches people's lives on a weekly basis. So that's really exciting. This third era of aviation that we're all starting to um, create is uh, as big a, a new adventure as uh, the, the days of the Wright brothers or even uh, the, day, the jet age. So this, this is kind of a third era of av av aviation. So around the world today, uh, aviation activity occurs uh, most most of the flights are in North America. 60% of GA flights exist in North America. The next largest segment is here in Europe, uh, and then distributed around the world. And we see tremendous growth in Asia. So it's growing from something very small. However, the growth rates are, are really large. So these are other really interesting markets to look at. The aircraft in the sky today are really old, right? So uh, the average age is over 50 years old now uh, of a product. So what industry can you name uh, that is successful, that has an average product that's 50 years old. Uh, maybe you like the mortuary business, I don't know. Uh, what other successful business? So, so there are some indications that we need to uh, uh, really understand our environment and bring the population into aviation uh, to really realize what it should be. Some of the work that we've had a chance to do over the last 10 years, um, some of our colleagues from EASA are in the audience, we've been able to work here in Europe with EASA to revitalize the rules for designing these aircraft, the foundational rules. So what I've got for you there, CS23, the rules for designing small aeroplanes, which are up to 8,135 kilo, something like this. Uh, the old rules, Amendment 4, that was 377 regulations, a big stack of very detailed rules that were based in technologies of the 1950s and 60s. And we were able to change that with, with working with IASA to a stack of paper that's much, much smaller. 70, 71 regulations that are now performance-based, right? Instead of telling you how to implement an old technology using a carburetor, the rule now discusses designing a reliable propulsion system. And then means of compliance for doing that exist in standards. That's really, really important. The reason that you see car companies come out with new model year cars every year is because they work on standards that can evolve quickly over time. When side curtain airbags seem to be a good idea, the standards can be updated and those things can be put into place. Aviation was not in this world until just the last two years. We've now in Europe built this new system that can evolve very quickly as technology evolves. So it's a very powerful tool that we have. In this group, uh, the standards body that we're working in, We've already taken on a whole number of new technologies, and I'm kind of lift, listing them there on the side. One of those being eVTOL means of compliance. So means of compliance for these new vehicles are being developed very quickly through these standards uh, as we speak. In fact, at the end of April, we'll, we'll be sitting down to develop more in, in Brussels. Uh, so there you are. Yeah, th this group that we're doing a lot of this work, it's an international group called ASTM F44. 
There are over 300 international members, including regulators from all over the world. Uh, the next meeting will occur in Brussels, the 24th through 26th of April. So uh, this is a slide that always gets um, some people smiling. So if, if you look there, the red circle is around a car. So in 1900, that's Fifth Avenue on Easter morning, and that's a car circled with a whole bunch of horse and buggies on the street. And then 13 years later, 1913, the same street, and I'm circling for you the horse and buggy, right? So in that short period of time, long ago, society changed dramatically based on the utility of these new vehicles, the, the powerful gasoline engine, uh, putting it to use, and the horseless carriage was born. Uh, and so I guess what I'm talking to you about today, I, I've kind of coined this, this silly phrase, the horseless aerial carriages uh, of today are the EV toll, right? So we're, we're looking at these vehicles very heavily. So we've seen a number of hybrid electric airplanes. Uh, some very successful designs are moving quickly through. Um, the Pipistrel Alpha Electro is, is now available for sale. It's at the show here. A number of others are finishing a flight, and some are just beginning, uh, including Frank. You've, we've got your product up there, too. Uh, and then from the eVTOL perspective, Mark did a great job of kind of highlighting the range of vehicles. Um, but we're starting to see a whole number of these flying. Many of them are going through actual certification process now with the regulators in Europe and in the US and in China. Um, and, and the hurdles for these vehicles uh, are not at all insurmountable. So we have very clear paths to compliance in most of these countries. Um, the questions of how to operate most efficiently, how to operate them at scale, these are questions we need to start answering. But the early days, the crawling days to make this come to reality is, is upon us. Uh, one of the interesting things um, as we've been working in this field, back in 2017, this report came out of UBS and said that this was a $35 billion opportunity. And we said, wow, this, you know, we had a sense it was a big deal, that's, that's a lot of money. And then this year, uh, a Morgan Stanley report came out that said 1.5 trillion. Um, so I, I wouldn't uh, dispel, some, some folks have said we're in the hype cycle. This is probably true. I think there are 170 some projects announced. But I would caution you not to dismiss uh, this industry based on the hype cycle, because certainly there won't be 170 of these products in the next 10 years. But there will be uh, around a dozen, or at least half a dozen, that are very, very real and very, very capable. Um, and we are really living exciting days. So as engineers, it's time to work. I, to close here, I wanted to show you um, a little deep dive into the regulatory environment around the world. So the first column is Brazil, ANAC Brazil. The second column is China, CAAC China. In the center, we have IASA the FA in the US, and then finally Transport Canada. And what I've done for you, back when we began really working this industry um, regulatory scheme in 2015, I built this chart to show where we think uh, the regulations are ready for these kind of aircraft and whether or not. And so I'll walk through this year to year. You'll see over time uh, through the work, and here we are to today. Um, so today in small aircraft, based on the work that we've done in CS23 and Part 23 and the other commensurates around the world, it is now possible to certify and field all electric aircraft that was impossible just five years ago. Uh, the road here in Europe, we see the engine and propeller folks at IASA really starting to embrace these paths. They're working on special conditions to certify motors and propellers with electric aircraft. Uh, and a lot of the work, thanks to Siemens and others here in the room, uh, the rotorcraft folks at IASA are now working on SCV toll and new paths. And there is a lot of discussion about even large aircraft where we all say, wow, our batteries ready for that. Uh, so regulations are not holding us back at this point. Um, we certainly have more to do, but uh, it, the risk is very, very low there. Uh, so with that, I appreciate it, and I look forward to the conversation. Really, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And perhaps just for adding here, because as we are on the arrow here, we have all the general aviation area, which is where Greg main area is where he works, the certified aircraft, which are on the, in the a holes, and there are some projects coming up which will be flying very soon, but we have also the b holes on the other side, uh, and there we have a lot of the ultralight area, and so there are even some of the products you have probably seen in the media which have been flying already, even eVTOLs, manned eVTOLs, which is the eVOLO, which is up to now one of the very few ones which is flying, and they are flying under ultralight regulations. And one thing uh, as addition from my side here is 
last year, over the last years, we talked about raising the ultralight weight limit of max for maximum takeoff from 450 to 600 kilograms. This has happened, and here at the show, we will have the very first aircraft which we'll receive is ultralight. We will say, not, as it's not an EASA certification, but it's ultralight homologation. Uh, which is a pipistrel virus, which will be 600 kilogram ultralight, which opens a whole world for all the electric projects, because now you have 150 kilograms more on board to put batteries, because that's one of the issues over the last years. The, the energy in batteries is much more heavy than it is in, uh, in fuel, and that's why the aircraft, if it has to fly a acceptable distance, has to have more weight allowance. This has been realized now, so I'm looking forward to seeing more electric projects going to the air in the very near future. And with this, I pass over to another project which has been shown in this spring at Airbus. And uh, uh, so we will hear more from Jörg Muller from the Urban Air Mobility. And this is, Airbus is not creating ve vehicle, they also created this term, urban air mobility, which is now taken over by a lot of other people. Thanks very much, Willy, and good morning, everybody. So, uh, yes, indeed, we, we had this vision. Um, may I move a slide forward, please? Uh, we had... Works. Okay, so um, we had this vision about urban air mobility when the term didn't really exist yet, of course, uh, the, about five years ago. And it's easy to imagine that, yes, there will be beautiful flying vehicles over cities. Uh, you can easily visualize it. But what really made a difference um, to our management as well to embrace this idea of urban air mobility is what, what Greg and Mark said, bringing together this market opportunity um, and the technical means that come uh, that come along with electrification, autonomy, uh, and connectivity, and so on. Um, I think it's 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 uh, it's a major. I mean, it's a it's a major change in society that's happening around mega trends of urbanization, the resulting mobility needs, the traffic jams. Everybody knows it, so everybody can actually feel and experience that from time to time the most often possible, it would be great to have an alternative to existing ground transport. And even if you don't believe in the numbers um, that some, uh, some researchers put out, um, there will be a big need, a big opportunity and great technical solutions to cope with them. So, what now, now a little word about how Airbus did uh, go about it. I think uh, Mark has very well explained the, the technical um, aspects of the, the, this new design space that electric propulsion is opening to us and gives us these new opportunities. So I put this beautiful picture, a uh, happy girl looking in an idyllic future city, uh, everything's green and nice, so I just I didn't put it for that reason, I put it because actually it represents Airbus's approach to the problem. Um, you see on this slide almost all initiatives that we had launched about two or three years ago. And uh, we put right in the middle, you can see a drone, it's a cargo drone, but it's not necessarily for the cargo drone itself, it's more like on how to develop certifiable vehicles to fly over population um, and, and do that conjointly with authorities, in this case it's the Singaporean Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore, and we, we call this project Skyways, we are uh, flying over the, our campus at the university there. You can see two flying vehicles. Uh, I'll go into detail a bit later. I have a, a slide on, on each one of them. You can see a bit of ground infrastructure on the right. Uh, and obviously everything is evolving in an airspace that's crowded, that needs to be managed. So there's the air traffic management aspect to it as well. Before showing the vehicles, I would like to make one point about the customer. Because at the end, we are serving a customer that has mobility or transport need. Um, so one of our projects that we are doing already since, uh, since a year and a half or two years is a project we call Boom, and that's a helicopter on demand ride hailing service that we are operating in Sao Paulo and Mexico City for now. So, so this one's a beautiful helipad with a beautiful helicopter of ours in, in, in Mexico City, and I tried it out. And once you have experienced how, what, what kind of freedom it gives you, if you can evolve in a mega city like Sao Paulo with 20, 000, uh, 20 million inhabitants, you can get from everywhere in town to almost everywhere in town, well, with the limits of the existing, existing ground infrastructure in about 10, 15 minutes, where it would take you two, three hours by car in, in, in the worst case. You, you get a totally new relationship to, to space and, and time, I would say, uh, in, in how you experience such a mega city and what you can do, what you can achieve 
for, for business, for your private life, you can save a lot of time. And that's an amazing experience. And I think uh, everybody uh, who does not believe so much in the possibility of Aaron mobility should try to experience it and see that it's, uh, it's amazing. And this service, we are offering it at relatively competitive, uh, competitive prices. It's a bit over 100 euros for a typical airport to uh, financial district flight, uh, 11 minute flight. Just brief, very briefly, two vehicles. This is our Vahana vehicle standing here in Oregon on the Pendleton um, drone test range. It's doing flight tests. I have a, a little video that we, we try to know. I'm not sure that I managed to, to start a video. Ah, great. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a, this is a one-seat technical demonstrator. So it's, it's not a final product that you'll be running or producing and, and operating one day. We don't put people in it. It's rather there to give us the means to develop a future generation of, of, uh, of vehicles, of EV tolls. This one's now flying um, at uh, over 70 knots. It, it's, it's both through its transition and it's um, yeah, and it, it, it will, will conclude its, its flight test program in the near future. Um, and the second project that we are that we are having, and that's the, the Ingolstadt point that you made, Willy, really, very briefly. This is the city Airbus here, standing in our facilities in Donauberg, not far from from here, but a bit uh, well north of Augsburg. Um, and And, uh, which uses the Siemens motors uh, that we talked about. So this is a vehicle that's in a more like a two-ton range. Uh, it's a design of a classical multi-rotor, designed for urban, for urban environments. Uh, easy access, big windows. It's a bit like a helicopter. It can be operated very flexibly. It can have a pilot at the beginning if needed. And what we have done in Ingolstadt, um, I think, was also for us, for somebody like Airbus, uh, a bit of a first because we for the very first time we presented this, it was to the public. Because what we wanted to make the point, we are developing a service for the public, um, and, and we presented it on the main, uh, main square in front of the, of the town hall of Ingolstadt, uh, with a lot of, of, of reaction, a lot of uh, resonance from it, but that was just uh, three weeks ago, roughly. Um, I think i leave it there for now, and happy to discuss. So, perhaps uh, you pass the mic right next to Frank, whose company, is making the motors for this vehicle because without motor, without drive, none of our the aircraft uh, which we want to use for uh, transport will move around. So we heard from Frank over the years, he's been several times here on the panel in E-Flight Expo, how the visions of Siemens are, how they are developing. So after releasing the first conventional aircraft products here on the show, which was the uh, Extra 300, which was the Magnus Effusion. So now you're reached the vertical point of view. So what's next? Yeah, really many times here at this podium at uh, the E-Flight Expo. And I remember when I was sitting here for the first time many, many years ago, I was looking into the faces of 99% uh, skeptic disbelievers. Now today, in the audience, there are at least 50% friends working in this area and working on different designs of aircraft or propulsion systems. Yeah, so Greg, it's not a hype, it's real. Our friends are sitting here, it's real. And I remember it somehow started, it all started like uh, one and a half decades ago when at cafe, um, at the cafe, at the famous cafe meeting in the Santa Rosa, and I want to give, give explicit credit, credit uh, to Joben Beaver, my friend Joben at that time. He showed me for the first time an animal that has tilted wing, tiltable wings, which, which, is, which was based on a duck hawk or sparrow hawk, a sailplane, and had eight distributed uh, propellers and a few in the back, and uh, these tilted wings, a little bit like the Vahana that you were showing. And at that time, it was a lot of fun because everybody was calling us crazy. And we started that. And in the last years, I think Siemens and others have really shown that electric propulsion systems are possible, that it is possible to increase the power density by an order of magnitude. We still have to prove that it is possible to make this absolutely safe. We are very far, but we are not there. Safety, certification, 
are the things that we are now approaching. We have just applied uh, to certify the um, uh, SP70D propulsion system, which has 70 kilowatt. Now, where is it going? I have no slides because I don't know what I would have to show you. And I will explain you why. Hybrid, and we do believe in hybrid electric propulsion. I have to say that. We think that there is only very few niches in which pure battery applications uh, make sense. And uh, these could be easily derived from hybrid electric propulsion systems where you simply leave out uh, the, uh, the turbine part uh, for this very special application. But we feel that for most applications, um, except for niches, it will be hybrid electric propulsion. Now, what are the essentials? Hybrid electric has a separation of power generation from thrust generation, number one. That allows you to play with the design of the aircraft. Number two, there is a benefit of distributed propulsion. You can put the propulsion on the aircraft wherever you want and wherever you want to have the thrust vector. So again, you can play with the design of the aircraft. That means, and this is new, this is historically new, you open the design space for hybrid electrically propelled aircraft widely. Up to now, you have exactly known the areas in the design space. You have uh, range, payload, uh, certain engine, and you know where in the design space your aircraft will be good. This changes. We do not know. This design space is now huge. And this is why I say I didn't bring any slides, because I cannot tell you which of these animals will be the right one, will be the best one. That's probably the reason why Uber has done this uh, very intelligent approach of, of more putting more focus on motivating as many players in this field to start and design vehicles rather than focusing on designing vehicles themselves. And yes, there are 150 or so which are coming out of the stealth mode and everybody is believing that, hey, this, this animal will be the right aircraft. Yeah, they all, they all look fantastic. But could there not be the assumption that the final winner is maybe not even yet among them, that it will still be some way to go to find out where in the design space are these damned spots where hybrid electric propulsion, distributed propulsion really pays. Does that mean we should wait? Not at all. We have to move forward. So it is good that so many are concentrating on that, that so many are working on that, that many are getting out of the stealth mode. But it also tells me <coughs> that there will be the need for consolidation in this industry at one point in time. Maybe not now, because now everybody is eager to get his or her model to the point. Maybe in five years, maybe in ten years. But Greg has shown how fast it went from the horse to the car. So if it goes fast, then maybe it's now time that we think about a little bit of starting consolidation, starting working together, starting to get out of the stealth mode and intelligently combine the activities of several who call themselves competitors, but who have to realize that this is pre-competitive. That in this phase, it is good that many are working on different designs, but it has to be directed towards the goal. What is the goal? I think the first benefit of hybrid electric propulsion, hybrid electrically propelled aircraft will be low noise. Maybe this will be the biggest benefit in the first decade of usage. And this might dominate which areas of the design space will be the winners. And here I want to admit that, yes, I do believe in EV tall, but I strongly believe in ES tall. Again, something that we discussed a couple of years ago at CAFE, at the CAFE meeting. 
electrically short takeoff and landing aircraft. They may still have wings. They, surely they have wings. They have wings. They are able to take off, let's say, on, on a 100 meter, 300 feet distance or 150, 500 feet uh, distance. So the physical footprint is very small. But they might be much lower noise than any of the VTOL, the eVTOL concepts that we are thinking about. So while the physical footprint is not as small as for an eVTOL, not just 40 times 40 meters, but rather 300 meters times 200 meters. So while the physical footprint is a little bit, little bit larger, the noise footprint might be as well comparatively small, only 200 times 200 meters. And if you could not hear them outside of this small footprint, there might be a clear ability to have st such starting spots in urban areas. And to me, it is not yet clear whether the eVTOL will win, making a little bit more noise, but, but only needing this uh, small spot on the roof of the, of the building, or whether the eSTOL will win, or whether there is room for both. But in any case, it may and will change the way how aviation is operated. We are working on that. If you happen to pass by our, at our booth, then you will see that we are, we are investing a fortune into all different power levels from uh, 50 kilowatt to 2 megawatt for all these applications. But one thing is clear to me. It is not yet clear how the final animal will look like. So let's have fun. And it's clearly not a hype. It's reality. Okay, thank you, Frank. I think next one is uh, 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 number. Uh, no, that's my slide. Uh, the, the next one would be Bosch, right? Uh, right after Siemens Bosch, which is interesting, uh, and showed that here in Germany we have a solid base for this future of aviation. We've had Airbus which is French and German, German and French, depends from where you look. Uh, but we have Siemens, Bosch and a lot of other players which right now are looking at uh, eVTOL. So Bosch is not working on the motors, Bosch is not working on a vehicle. Please tell us what Bosch wants to do for getting these things airborne. Yes, right. Thank you, really. Uh, my name is Tony Jager Angelo. I'm representing Bosch Aviation here. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank my colleagues here for the uh, perfect introduction they gave. And yes, I think this is an exciting, exciting time where technology has advanced, computational power gives a lot more uh, possibilities to advance technology, advanced possibilities. And I think eVTOL or electric hybrid propulsion, as Frank uh, pointed it out, is a new leap into the future. And that is uh, where I want to uh, bring something in that Bosch is a technological company and on one hand side we have the aircraft but also in the aircraft there is a lot of technology that needs to be enabled uh, to allow this technology to be uh, put into series, put into production. So I would like to give a little overview about Bosch, about the technology and where the technology synergies will come together that will support this, uh, these possibilities. Bosch is a large uh, technological company, over 400,000 employees worldwide, representation in uh, over 60 countries. And uh, one of the things uh, in Bosch slogans, invented for life, that we are supporting developments, technology development in all areas and also like one-sixth of those 400 pe 400,000 people are working in research and development. Uh, basically, Bosch is divided up into four sections, mobility solutions, industrial, energy and building and com com customer goods. And the area that I would like to focus on today is the mobility area where like 60% of Bosch worldwide revenue comes from the mobility area. 
Part of the mobility area is Bosch Aviation Technology. I think as one of the few automotive companies, Bosch is now since 10 years supporting the aviation industry, the general aviation industry. Uh, we have built up two offices, one in Vienna, Austria, and one in the US, Nova, Michigan, where I am based, where we look at our portfolio, our Bosch automotive portfolio, where are the applications where we can leverage this technology. Here a little bit more in detail, where are we talking about uh, engine management systems, uh, driver assistance systems, new technologies like connected, connected uh, services, remote diagnostics, and hybrid electric propulsion. Here a little overview, on one hand side we try to use components of the shelf, commercial of the shelf components, so automotive technology that we can easily uh, apply into aviation. And on the other hand, uh, electronic systems that need special adaptations to conform with the aviation standards, the safety standards in aviation. Mobility of the future, uh, I think that that is where technologies come together and uh, one of the uh, other hype areas that are going to be reality is automated and autonomous driving. Uh, Bosch as a large automotive supplier uh, has a lot of resource uh, research, a lot of development in that area. Uh, basically, we see three areas that make that happen electrification, automation, and connectivity. In electrification, uh, Bosch was there from the beginning, and uh, already now, Bosch supported the first electric hybrid cars. Um, we have our technology in over 800,000 electric cars on the road already, uh, more of 30. Uh, different uh, electric hybrid models are propelled by Bosch uh, propulsion technology. That is what you see uh, on the left hand side, uh, also on the right hand side, uh, Bosch e-bike, uh, e-scooter, other mobility is supporting the whole gamma from uh, small uh, power up to high power in the uh, mobility mobility uh, sector. The second area is automated. Uh, automated is one of the big uh, factors that uh, will uh, support uh, other mobility systems, other mobility solutions for uh, people either on the road as also in the air for eVTOL, also uh, automation and uh, autonomy will play a big role. In the beginning you will see piloted aircraft, but the transition to automation and uh, autonomy is a high focus point in there. In automotive it allows for uh, automated driving, relieving the driver of his functions in the car and the other area to autonomy where the driver has no input anymore. The Society of Automotive Engineers uh, have defined uh, five levels of automated driving where the driver still has a function up to level five where the driver has no direct function in the car anymore. Uh, one point that is very important in that is safety. And safety is non-negotiable, not for the car and also not for the aircraft. Bosch works on the technology behind that, the sensor technology, the computing technology to combine all that information and then the output technology, actuation to uh, influence the systems in the car that will control the, the vehicle. I mentioned it before, connectivity will be one of the key areas as well. Uh, how, does, how do those vehicles communicate with the ground, communicate with each other? 
and also therefore technologies like processing power, communication, how do you connect all those systems in the car, on the ground, and how do you provide for the consumer, for the user, new business models to use this technology in an efficient way, what also Mark from Uber Elevated pointed out. Yeah, why is this interested for Bosch? Uh, I, I showed you a lot of automotive technology, but uh, technology is, is uh, emerging over all areas. Uh, connectivity, automation, in real technology, industry 4.0, and also aviation, it will be combining much more in the future. Aerospace technology has been very specific in the past. Uh, aircraft were a small volume, uh, specifically developed technologies, and for the EV tools, where you will see uh, a higher volume, uh, where you need affor affordability. This opens an area where automotive technology with high volumes will provide a new entry point for making those technologies behind the skin possible. Uh, at, at, at the end of my presentation, uh, I want to point out one thing, maybe our, our latest product in that area yeah, thank you, Frank. This is a sensor box which we have developed based on automotive micromechanical sensor technology. Um, in aviation, it is called an uh, iner inertial measuring unit. Uh, with this product, we want to support a low cost, low rate uh, technology uh, to support navigation and control of e vital aircraft in the future. Okay. okay, thank, thank you. you, Antonio. And now we coming from the details back to, um, I think, next one is uh, Tian. Uh, you, because this is an aircraft and he is designing aircraft from the beginning and he will tell you the, he's been here at the show, like I said before, several times with electric aircraft and he has some new things to tell you. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, on the picture is a two-seat um, E430 we designed from 2009 and we finally certified 2017, it took eight years, a lot of work. Um, yeah, so um, I was uh, designing um, a lot of model airplanes since 2000 and uh, this was uh, very early, first ready to fly electric remote control aircraft uh, since 2000. And uh, at 2008, we were um, shipping a half million units per year. And uh, in a very peak, uh, we ship one million units. We total made um, 10 million remote control aircraft. So that's a lot. And uh, that's the first experience. Then, um, uh, from 2013, 14, 15, we um, developed a lot of uh, multi-copter, which um, consider as a flying camera. So now it's very popular, a lot of people using them. But this is a, a different way of flying from um, traditional fixed wing. Um, by making hundreds, thousands of them, we learn a lot how this kind of thing flies. So this is, um, like I mentioned, 2013, we get this uh, single seat, 24 kilowatt, um, e-spider certified uh, from Dove, and uh, 2017, we get um, E430 certified from Dove. Um, so we learn a lot by making those two aircraft proportion system, battery management system, energy management, so all these kind of things. And uh, from 2011, I was thinking, uh, how can we combine those two kind of uh, aircraft together? 
Um, Multicopter has this benefit of uh, no need of runway, but uh, not very efficient. And uh, fixed wing is much more efficient, but you need a runway. So, um, yeah, we applied first patent in 2011 um, in all kind of configuration. How to combine um, multi-copter and fixed wing together. Um, basically, after a lot of testing, you know, calculation, we find out their um, power density of um, multi-copter usually around uh, 100 to 200 watt per kilograms, but fixed wing, you only need a 30 to 50. So it's basically five times more efficient when you fly fixed wing. And the range is about eight to 10 times because you have almost double the speed. So this makes a lot of sense to fly by fixed wing, but take off landing by using multi-copter. But uh, it's very hard to design two aircraft to combine in one. So this is an exciting point of after 100 years, plus 100 plus years when the aircraft in, in, you know, developed, then we have um, a new way. We are finding a new way of flying which is combining all these kind of, um, you know, fixed wing and multi-copter together, use the very minimum energy, uh, for example, when we use electric um, battery. So this is an uh, exciting part, why that's why we are together here doing this. Um, you can see all kind of design, but uh, now I like to show everybody that our design this is a V600. Um, this, we are having um, six speaker rotor, 2.3 meter each, and a two seat uh, tandem design. Um, this is pure electric. Um, so forward flying is around 160 kilometer speed, and a little bit less to our flight time. It's a big challenge to make it light to have enough space or wait for the battery. So this is our design, this is our solution. And uh, our team is working very hard on that in the last few weeks, sleeping very little, thank you, <laughs> our client's team. And uh, yeah, I think our friend named it Venus. I, I kind of like the name. So. That's a design. Um, the concept is, you know, um, electric pressure system, conventional kit gear, control service flying as a fixed wing. Then we we were we are able to use a fixed wing mode to fly it first to make sure this is a good fixed wing aircraft. In the second level, we were do the transition at high altitude, and then we will do it at low altitude, unmanned hover, then the last we do the low altitude, vertical takeoff, and the transition. So that's our way to do it. So these aircraft have um, three different ways of landing. Of course, the first way is a, is a tra traditional fixed wing landing. The second way is we we have a vertical takeoff, multi-copter way landing. The third is we also have parachute. So in case we have parachute. So we have three different way of landing. So I think uh, we were certified, try to certify this as our ultra light at 600 kilograms first, two seat tandem. Um, then. After that, we will move to a bigger size. So, can we have the video? Or can, can perhaps, because we, like always, we are running a bit short of time. You can, as we can see the aircraft later, because that's a great news, uh, we, we, will, we will have here at the show. It's not a computer animation, 
uh, we will uh, uh, we will have the real aircraft here on the show, and it will be shown uh, right after this event here. If you come over to the A7, uh, you see at the booth of Autoflight X where the aircraft will be unveiled. Right now, you just see it under a cover, but you can see the aircraft then right now because we still have one presentation, and we would like to have a little bit time for discussing. So, should we play video first, or? Um, I, I think let's play the video right in the end when we when we leave. Sorry, but uh, otherwise, okay. So our now we heard from uh, designers from uh, and from people who designed parts of it. Now we have somebody who's making research on how perhaps it will really look. So Mirko, please tell us what Bauhaus Luftfahrt found out about EV tolls. Thank you, um, Willy and. First of all, I guess what has been discussed and what has been seen is that some of the technologies really do open up now the design space for the vehicle. So I will not talk about the vehicle itself. Let's go to a more elevated, not directly Uber elevate, but elevated view on, um, on the business itself. Um, so in aviation, we have been in the market now for more than seven decades flying origin destination. The key problem is we ne have never made business door to door. And now where we're getting into is if we talk about urban air mobility, so especially in the urban environment, what we have to get into a market which is designed and designated to provide door to door traffic. So um, even now with smaller vehicles and um, electric VTOL um, configurations showing the possibility to have lower noise levels, to have a smaller footprint in the city, uh, we might be able to get closer to the final destination and also to the origin of the uh, passenger. But nevertheless, we have to talk about intermodal and transmodal um, transport concepts and transport chains again and still keep that in mind that we have to integrate in there. And Mark already uh, addressed it. We have to think about how we put the infrastructure in place and how to connect it to the rest of the transport system to really make the system work and also to get a business model if we want to provide a benefit to the customer. And the customer in that case is also part of the community that in the end has to accept this new model of transport in the cities. So just to play a little bit with the figures, um, we have to consider what is the existing system. So the current taxi share, so um, taxi riding is about 1% of the transport capacity that you provide in, in, in cities. Ride hailing in San Francisco, for example, is something in the order of 10 to 15%. Um, public transport, if we take Munich, for example, we are talking about 24% in the city, so it's a big share, and 11% in the suburbs, so in that area of roughly 2.5 million people living in and around Munich. So. On a global scale, still a medium-sized city, but nevertheless, let's take Munich as an example as we, we know it best. If we um, talk for the Munich metropolitan area, um, we have an expe expected population growth plus 9%. Um, so this is more or less a standard one which is relevant for all big cities. So what we see at the same time population growth as well as area growth of the big cities. So this is one of the key elements and we have to find solutions to get door-to-door -door, um, traffic in that domain. So we have 4.5 million inhabitants if we do a greater scale or a greater circle around Munich. So it's roughly 8.7 million trips um, that we do have to share. If we talk about now urban air mobility getting into the range of um, taxi which is accepted uh, means of transport, providing, let's say, transport capability for almost everybody, uh, we would have 1% modal share, which would be around 87,000 trips per day that we have to somehow get into just the Munich area. If we would talk about a significant, taking a significant part of the ground transportation into the air, we would talk about 10%, um, 870,000 trips per day. So really have to talk about an efficient way to integrate it and to also operate it. And acceptance in that case is something we have to make sure that it doesn't work. So um, Munich Airport, 1,000 movements uh, per day. So this is about the reference that we know. So we are getting into unknown terrain, how to 
operate vehicles, airborne vehicles, on a very, very high frequency with a high level of safety, with a high level of reliability, also taking into consideration if we want to operate it on a business case, we have to provide all weather capabilities into cities. And that's something which is not so common if we talk about smaller scale um, um, aircraft in the current technology level. So capacity, if we um, just think about the infrastructure, um, Uber is talking about roughly 1,000 landings uh, per hour, um, so 6 to 12 pads, so we are talking about um, 23 seconds per takeoff and landing cycle, um, if we would take 150 landings um, per, per hour, and four pads, we would be talking about something like one and a half to two minutes, um, 24 landings per hour, it would be roughly 60 seconds. But you already see with the numbers that we have seen before, the efficiency of the infrastructure of the pad is driving the capacity of the system and therefore also the transport impact that we can do. So we have to take a look at it into, in an integrated manner so it doesn't make sense to just look at the vehicle itself, although it brings a big benefit if we get new features with the vehicle itself. If we take an example, Munich opening hours 6 to 11 in the evening, um, because it depends a little bit how much we can get down in the noise level, if we also can work on a, a regular basis during the night times. Uh, we would end up something in a taxi scale, um, 61 large verticals up to 213 uh, verticals. So we already have to think about how we get there, how we integrate them efficiently at the right transport nodes. Because again, we're not providing the last mile or the last couple of hundred meters to the final door where the passenger has to get. So we have to find an intelligent way how to integrate it into the rest of the transport modes. And other technologies like autonomous driving, for example, can help, can support our business model. So we have to think about that very um, early. So if we talk about 61 or even 614 vertiports into a city area like, like Munich, that's already a task. Um, but if we talk about smaller ones, which would make the integration burden much less, we would talk about much higher numbers. So um, that's quite interesting and we have to work on that. And we are currently working also um, closely together with Airbus to, to get models how this could be done, how this could be efficiently done. Just as a comparison again to what is state of the art, so this is what is currently um, as infrastructure in the system in Munich, so we are talking about 100 um, underground stations, so if we are talking about 60 to 600 um, vertiports integrated into a city, we are in the same order of magnitude that we currently already see in public transport. Still, they are providing a much higher capacity in the overall system. So this is something I don't want to say, okay, uh, we are trying to get something where it's very hard to get in there. We just have to keep in mind to be able to place the infrastructure into the system. We have to get also the acceptance from the, publication, uh, from the public and they have to see a benefit and um, we have to provide test cases, use cases, early use cases where you can see, okay, it's also something that the common public passenger will be able to use to make it acceptable for them really to also support on the political side those investments that are necessary to do that transport road integration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, like very often, we have so many interesting things to talk that we don't have much time left to, uh, for discussion. Excuse me for this, but uh, we have too many interesting things to, to listen to. But if uh, uh, I would like to ask at least one or two questions to the people here, which yeah. know which work on the EV toll, uh, what, when do you think the first service of an EV toll will uh, happen in a city and where? in which country. So Frank is uh, having an uh, answer for this and the others, please also. I'm, I'm known to be optimistic, uh, but I would say uh, it will be 2027 plus minus a little bit, uh, maybe 2026 or 28. 
uh, where we will see certified eVTOL starting uh, offering the first services under certification. And um, uh, we have discussed a lot about uh, is it real? Yes, it is real. And if you are in doubt, just have a look at what we have done. We have a two megawatt uh, engine which uh, will be operated in a few days uh, starting. Uh, Siemens has the 200 uh, kilowatt thing, which is uh, the propulsion system which is in the city Airbus and which will fly very, very soon. We are presently developing a 500 kilowatt drive system which we intend to build into a Dornier 228 to electrify, which has been derived from the 260 kilowatt thing. The 260 kilowatt will go into CS23 certification within the next three to four years. And the 70 kilowatt thing, we applied for certification and it will very soon go into a at least one uh, customer plane, and you can uh, see this uh, at the Siemens booth, which is the, um, uh, the e-flyer, and there is a second one. I'm, I'm saying that not being meant as a commercial. I'm rather saying that in order to make you aware, there is business opportunities for all of you, and it is real. And when I'm answering Willy's question by saying it will be not later than 2027 that they are certified in operation, then all the things that I have now mentioned are proof points. I, I would even go a little bit more aggressive. We don't exactly talk about eVTOL. I guess um, Airbus has already shown with the VOOM in the cooperation with Uber that is currently already operational on a helicopter basis. And I guess we should do it both ways already implemented and get the business model running and get it also known to the uh, to the public on the helicopter basis really to providing that service and then complement it with early phases of getting vehicles done starting with the drone business and then going um, to the bigger ones showing early demonstrations about the key features where you can get benefit from EV towards in that, in that market sector. So, so perhaps, Mark, uh, like I would like to have your opinion. When do you think the first uh, system, perhaps an Uber system or another system, when do you think the first uh, EV toll service will be available and in which city? What is your guess? It, it's not a guess. We've been very uh, upfront uh, sharing our vision and we are still on the plan to be able to execute a 2023 startup service in Dallas. So I will say very specifically, there are demonstrators flying that I've seen and heard that are much closer to certification than people realize. Everything is not going to be shown publicly, but uh, there is an executable path to achieve certification by 2023. Okay, that's a very ambitious plan and I hope it gets through, perhaps it can. Uh, when do you think your aircraft will fly and when do you think it will perhaps go to service? I totally agree uh, Mark, Mark's timeline. Okay, so 2023. So um, I'm not sure you will probably uh, have to move out here because we are out of the time, so um, I would say uh, thank you for coming, thank you for coming, being on the podium, sorry for not being too exact with the timing, which is my fault, um, but we have a lot of things to see here at the show, so I don't want to keep you too long here, so perhaps if you could put on the next slide um, from the first presentation, and uh, next one, and then one, one further, yeah, so, by Greg, he has to run because they have their own event. We put together all the news on the, of the eFlight Expo, the presentation, everything in the eFlight Journal, which we put out, which is free for download. You also can grab a copy, which are la laying around here, or you can scan the QR code, then you have it on your cell phone. Um, and next, next slide, please. And we, uh, we created here at Aero a new area, which is an e-connect area. So if you want to c continue your discussion, it's in the e-flight hall, which is right 
on the right hand side you can go there seven, all the uh, or a lot of companies have connection points there there are other stages where we have more time to talk and um, now I'll leave the word for Tian, the final word, because he has this announcement of his aircraft, which will be, you can follow him right from here to the uh, unveiling. Shall we, shall we see the video first? Okay, we can show first the video and then look at the real aircraft. Okay. Because this is the vision how the aircraft will fly, and the, the thing is, it is much closer to the flying than most of you will think if the video is coming. Please. This is a V600 video. Nice. It's a 2C 600 kilograms. EV2. So, safe landing here, so, um, yeah, perhaps invite. Yeah, um, let's go take a look at the real one. So, if you're interested in this kind of flying, you just follow us over to the A7 hall, where there will be the unveiling of exactly this aircraft, which we should fly in the next few months. Thank you very much for being here, and sorry for...